Hello there and welcome to my vlog of January 2022. This will actually be a two-part recording. So today's episode that you are seeing will be my top five mechs across the inner sphere. And the next part of this will be, you've probably guessed it already, my top five mechs for the clans. And the reason why I am separating those two out is just because both sets of mechs for Inner Sphere and Clans are so different, obviously, in terms of like aesthetics and weapon loadouts and just general competency, because obviously the clan mechs are like incredible. And Inner Sphere mechs, not so much. Um, well, saying that, I mean, there are some obviously amazing uh, Inner Sphere mechs, but when you kind of compare it to Clans, it's really not like you can't really do that comparison without it getting silly because the clan technology is just so like far in advance of anything the inner sphere are doing obviously that changes after the clan invasion the inner sphere kind of get up to spec but um, i thought it was just best to like separate them out um, mainly because um, of the aesthetic reason though as opposed to anything to do with the, the gameplay style because the clans just have their own like unique way of like uh, designing mechs and I suppose that segues me nicely into like the criteria for this video um, because you can see number one there is does the mech look cool but let's talk about these two points before I kind of get into the list um, and obviously the rules then for how I'm going to be ranking but I think it's it's good to set things like, um, you know, set like criteria down if you are going to make a list like this because it's very, very difficult in Battletech to kind of just come up with what is your favourite mech because they're, there are going to be like several different things that come into play. So if you are going to do this, I want to do something similar, then I'd advise you kind of put some like um, defined parameters on it before you kind of go forward. And I know like the first point there looks like really superficial, like does the mech look cool? But at the end of the day, this is a tabletop hobby where you are like painting the mechs and potentially displaying them. And if they don't look good, you know, if you're kind of picking mechs that, are on the ugly side or what you perceive subjectively as the ugly side obviously you're not going to take much joy out of it so that's kind of my like uh, way of thinking anyway i know there'll be people who completely disagree with that and think well who cares how it looks like it's amazing on tabletop and that's all i care about if that's the case then that is your set criteria you've basically defined it for me though it's kind of a, a halfway house because then you will have people who only play mechs because they look cool um, so I kind of sit very much in the, in the middle of that. And I think that's quite a good place to be because then obviously I can have a discussion like this and tick a lot of different boxes. So I can kind of talk about how aesthetically pleasing a mech is or, oh, this is really, really like crunchy on tabletop and suits my style of play. Um, so I suppose that kind of segues in there to the second point. So does this uh, mech fit my style of play and have some crunch on tabletop? Well, that is important if you play tabletop and you liked the tactical element of Battletech, which I certainly do. So those kind of two things combined, I think, are going to be like my um, subjective criteria, really, for, for ranking. There are other things as well, like as I'm going through this list, there might be like little bits of information that I find quite interesting for a certain mech and that maybe got them on this list. So there can be many like weird and wonderful, um, you know, like reasons for why you're judging something like this as well there's obviously like the nostalgia factor as well so like you might just really like a mech from a certain era because you played that as a kid or that was the first model you painted so there are you know other things as well you can kind of factor in that is certainly a factor in my favorite mech and if you've if you've watched any of my episodes before and I've spoken about this, you will know what my favourite mech is. You probably won't know the other four, but you'll probably know the uh, the one that's going to hit the top of this list. I think another thing as well just to say is, or why I think this is, is an interesting thing to do if you are into battle tech, it's, it really is kind of the ling lingua franca that we all engage with as like battle tech um, players or fans, whatever you want to call us, because... It's one of those questions that when you ask another Battletech player what is your favourite mech, 
it's almost like asking someone you've never met before, like what town they're from or what country they're from, because their answer is really going to kind of dictate symbolically what you then feel about them before you get to know them. Right. So like it's that like getting to know you ask question. For instance, if someone said to you, like, um, I'm from um, Poland and I'm 65 years old or something like that, that person is going to be super interesting. And if they lived in Poland, you probably will be like, wow, this person like lived, you know, uh, through the Cold War on the like, you know, in the Eastern Bloc. So it kind of, you know, it, it gives you that kind of impression. Obviously, then it's like. I suppose your job as a human to kind of then dig past all that and then you, uh, you know, get to know that person and and you, you obviously look beyond then the kind of um, like the bigger picture stuff and, and get to know them individually. It's quite an abstract thing I'm talking about there, but like for Battletech, it's the same. Like if someone says to you, what is your favourite mech? They're basically just like scouting for intel. And I'm not... I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's not like some weird thing. That's just what we all do as human beings when we meet each other in in new circumstances, new situations, whatever. But for BattleTech, that is our version of that question. So, for instance, if someone like says to you something like, "My favorite mech is the Anubis," right? Well, what does that tell you about that place, person? Well, that means they're a pretty sneaky tabletop player because the Anubis is one of those like Capellan light mechs that likes to fire off. Um, long range missiles from afar and they probably like electronics so they probably like to kind of mask their you know um, force from the enemy that kind of thing I mean not necessarily they might just say like well I just love ancient Egypt and it's got an Egypt name and it's got silly ears or something like that you know like there can be obviously a hundred reasons why but when you kind of delve into it it is that that first like point of call, uh, sorry, part of call question that that will come up and that you can then like fires off a greater debate. Um, I also think it's like it's not just for other people either. It's very much for yourself to kind of see where you fit into BattleTech. And I'm going to kind of make a little bit of a um, it's not. I don't want to say it's advice, but. If you are like relatively new to Battletech, I'd certainly advise that you think about things like what is your favorite mech for the simple reason that you will have a much better time navigating your like Battletech experience if you know the answer to that. And I'm just going to give you like a quick, um, I suppose, societal anecdote or something like that that I see a lot in the Battletech community, especially since I've come back into it. And that's that... I find that a lot of people are like really enamored by like the Lyran Commonwealth. You know, there's this like massive loving for, for the Lyran Commonwealth. I think it's because a lot of like older players that people like really respect and revere are really into to have Steiner. And that's then kind of um, you know, pushed itself onto onto the wider community. And not in a bad way. I mean that's just inevitable how these things work, like through osmosis. But what you then find is that new players who come into the game, who maybe are coming from like different gaming systems, they hate. When oh sorry, I put this another way, they don't like how the Lyrans actually play on tabletop because they tend to bring assaults and heavies, and they tend to have like no like tactical um, nuances. It's very much like let's just get the big guns into the into the fray here and. I mean, I'm speaking completely subjectively here. I can't stand the, the Lyran Commonwealth um, just in terms of their game, um, like style play. I find it really boring and obnoxious and I'm just not interested in it at all. Um, but I'm steadily finding that like so many people are like really enamored by those like big Steiner mechs, like by the Zeus, the Atlas, uh, the Axeman, things like that. And... I think a lot of people gravitate towards that because they're trying to find their feet and then they're like, after three or four months, they'll be like, I really don't like these guys. They're really boring. Um, so that's why I'm, I, that's kind of my advice is kind of have a think about where you sit um, within things before you kind of really get into force collection and try not to be kind of like... Um, you know, say influence, we're all influenced, obviously, but like you'll find people, especially like older players, because they, they knew that like the Draconis Combine and the Capellans were like the bad guys in the early days of Battletech. 
So they'll have this like universal hate for them because when they were growing up, they will have like played, you know, like the federated uh, sons of the Lyra Commonwealth, Free Worlds League, and the Draconis come by and the um, the Capellans were always like the enemy. But, and I mean, I've I've gone on record as saying this before, I adore the Capellans. And had I not have, had I not have played when I was a kid, when I very much kind of, you know, put my, um, the Federated Sons flag on my flag post. If I just came into Battletech now and had an understanding of strategy, I would absolutely play Capellans. Um, I don't give a damn about, like, the political thing of it. It's a game, right? Like, you know, yeah, okay, they're all, like, crazy space communists and societally they're not very nice, but, my God, they have beautiful mechs. Uh, I also quite like their paint scheme as well. It's all pretty, like... Um, you know, I, I like the green. I can. You think you can always make green work quite easily when you're doing like paint schemes. I it, that I I can anyway. Uh, there's some I can't. You know, I I really struggle with like white, for instance. <laughs> Don't like white at all. Uh, but green tends to work. Um, but I can't. You know, given no matter how much I have, like like the Capellans as like a a font of a term of fighting force, I just have so much like. Uh, sentiment towards the fed sons because that's who i used to like really love and read the books for and and everything else when i was a kid and the capellans were their were their enemy but it's no surprise to me oh i think that secret like um adoration if you want to put it that way that i had for capellans manifested by the the mech or the mercenary group that I, or the force that i eventually created was in the capellan march so even though they were kind of federated sons they were still like very influenced by like Capellan civilization. The world where my mercenary force come from, which is Mendham, was at one time a Capellan system. So like, you know, I think it's maybe there was something going on there when I was a kid. I just couldn't admit it to myself, but I had a, a real like love for everything Capellan. And that's very much reflected on this mech on this sorry on this list because three of the mechs are very much associated with the Capellans. But again, you know, like from your point of view, just have a think about that. And, you know, you don't have to go crazy on it or anything and, you know, read loads of law. But just if you've played other gaming systems, like what factions do you like there? Are you more kind of interested in the aesthetic side of it? Um, even like really simple things like what's your favorite color? Right. Like for me, and again, I know the Draconis Combine have always been seen as like the bad guys, but... I really like the Draconis Combine as well. Like, they are red and they have, like, a really cool Japanese, like, aesthetic to them. They've got, like, mechs that have got, like, Japanese paraphernalia and they've got mechs with, like, samurai swords. I mean, how is that not cool, right? Like, that is just great. I mean, regardless of all the the law that's, or the, the dogma that's attached to the the, the Draconis Combine, the, the war crimes, the terror, etc., uh, you know, the Japanese feudalism in space, which is obviously a pretty hellish environment, I think, for, for people in that particular society uh, to live in. But this isn't real world, right? Like, in, so find your niche and then I think really wrong with it. And whatever other people are saying, and you say, you see it a lot, like people will like come across like Capellan players or Draconis Combine players or Clan Smoke Jaguar players or whatever and be like, um, well, in a friend of it's obviously Battletech and people... In my experience, anyway, in the community very much take it with a pinch of salt, and it's all good natured banter. Um, whatever they say to you, like, just be like, Well, that's my style of play, that's what I like to do, that's how I like to do it, and be damned to, to everyone <laughs> at that point. So, anyway, moving on, I'll go into my rules here. So, sorry, I just um, basically snipped this from Word, so there are still weird spelling um, things here in the uh in the copy so just ignore that um but these are my rules and they kind of i've set these out this is almost like a bit of a joke really so don't especially the last point like you know it's just because uh, i like winding people up um but the first is that i must own the model for it to be eligible for a ranking and all the photos that i've got here are actually of my models i that for me is quite a, an important thing because how can i proclaim to love a model if i'm not willing to like buy it and paint it so that's the thing. Uh, at least one mech from every weight class is in this list. So that's, you know, light, medium, heavy, and assault. 
I really wanted to do that as well to kind of give a nice like sprawl of, of options. And so that I was then forced to think about it. So because I do usually gravitate towards medium and heavies. And if I had my my way, this probably would have just been full of um, mediums and heavies. But I think like when I've thought about it and like read the kind of lore about these particular mechs and everything else. And, you know, I have been through the technical manu manuals in like preparation for this just to kind of because I kind of knew what the list was. I kind of whittled it down to about eight just off the top of my head. And then I wanted to kind of, you know, get it down to a final five. Um, but that weight class thing was was important because you know there's, it's just boring if you do a list like this and it's just five assault max that's a bit crass. Um, third point there is that it's this is between thirty twenty five and thirty sixty seven and if you know what an old miserable so and so I am you know that's the only period I play in BattleTech. I've got no interest in going above that. Obviously, most of these mechs, I think at least four of them. Uh, there's one that's quite like late era for me. But uh, most of them were obviously like Succession War era mechs or um, uh, Star League era mechs. So way before 3025. But what I'm talking about there is like, that's the era I play and all these mechs can be found in that era. Uh, the fourth point there, which is just meant as a bit of a joke, but bipedal mechs only between 20 and 100 tons. Anything outside of that criteria is basically trash Gundam inspired nonsense. I'm sticking by that. Fight me. End of story. Let's move on. So, drum roll, please. Let's have a look at number five. And get this to move. There we are. So, the mongoose. Let's zoom in again. I can't actually. That's, I can't um, swap photos without um, scrolling right out. So, if I forget to do that, that's why it's a little bit delayed. And um, I don't want to kind of give away what my full list is. So, I don't want to kind of going to other photos because you'll see the list. Um, so the mongoose, now I'm probably gonna start looking down here quite often because I've got the um, like the, the data sheets in front of me just so that I can discuss them. So the mongoose is uh, for me, probably the best light mech in the game. I, I think it's, it's absolutely amazing. And I'm talking like mechs that are relatively readily available. Like there will be light mechs you know, into the uh, Fedcom Civil War that are just incredible and completely outgun uh, this particular mech. And I've actually got one of them on the clan list. But just for like, especially like Succession Wars, this mech is insane. And you do actually find them in the Inner Sphere. It's very much a mech that you associate with like the Star League and then uh, Comstar as well. Like when, when the Comms Guard kind of... I mean, it's always kind of a thing, but when it officially becomes a thing and then goes to war with the clans up to the build-up of the Battle of Tukiid, uh, the Mongoose kind of makes a run back and they've obviously had lots tucked away in storage for a rainy day somewhere. But its weapon loadout is so, so impressive. It actually has uh, three M lasers and one S laser. Comes in at a speed of 812. So, you know, walking eight, running 12. No jump jets. But that's fine. When you've got an 812, I mean, the amount of like manoeuvring you can do with that mech is pretty brilliant. And if you get into a rear arc, even of like an assault mech, you're going to do pretty devastating damage to it with three M lasers. You know, you obviously, if you can get in there as well and use the S laser for that extra like three points of damage, wonderful. What I love about this mech, what I, what I find like most endearing about it really is its uh, heat management. So it's it's only got eight single heat sinks, but it only needs that really. Um, and it could do with a double's always nice, obviously, but they never went with that. Um, mostly because it's actually got ferrofibrous and endo steel on there. Uh, I'm not going to talk about what they are as a thing um, because that if I go through every component here, it's going to take me forever. But suffice to say, that's good but it, they both take up quite a few slots on the actual mech. So that's probably, you know, getting like, I mean, you might be able to do it, but getting like ferrofibrous endosteel and double heat sinks on a mech is, is pretty tough. If I don't know if it can be done, I'd have to go and, and check, but um, it's not easy anyway, because so many of the sl slots are then taken up with that, that good armor and the like uh, heightened structure. So, but 10 is absolutely fine um, because your like maximum heat that you're generating there on an alpha strike is actually 10 anyway. So you're only really going to be generating heat if you're running. So if you're running and alpha striking, then you will like generate two heat. But that's really quite good, actually. 
so just like for it's for it's just efficiency and speed and getting in for those rear attacks it just really really gives it a, a really nice advantage um i've played it a few times on tabletop um this the method you can see in the pitch there is for my free wills league force and um yeah it, it's it's as dangerous as it sounds i mean the, well, the one thing that it has that's not in its favor obviously is that it is a light mech however it's a light mech that can take a little tap of a punch i mean i always kind of judge a mech if, if you look at like on a light mech you're never going to get like vast quantities of armor on there but it comes in like on its torsos it's got 10 points of armor and then it's got um six points of, of armor on the on the side torso structure as well so like let's say you're going up later against like a, a clan mech or something like that it can take an erppc just if it gets to your torso um so you're really gonna have to rely on moving incredibly quickly and trying to like rear arc the enemy you can't stay still with this mech though really i mean it's um it doesn't some mechs you absolutely can stay still with you know like you can get into cover and you can pew pew off from afar this mech though has got really quite limited range it's got a max range of nine or nine hexes nine inches whatever you want to say um so you really kind of are going to be wanting to use this as like an up close and personal shock to like an assault mech uh, by getting into the rear arc so that's the mongoose uh, next up let me zoom out here next up we have got the enforcer a 50 ton mech obviously a, a mech that's close to my heart for for several reasons not least of all because it's like the the poster child for the uh the fed sons as far as their mechs go it ticks every box that the the fed the fed sons like it uh, is a medium mech 50 tons it's got a big cannon on its arm they love that they love their ac weaponry um it's jump capable as well and the fed sons tend to be quite a like a tactical um force it's kind of like in a sense it's a shame that the um like militarily it's a shame that fedcom never survived because i think if you've got like steiner's brutality and dare i say stupidity when it comes to warfare if you kind of mix that in with like a lighter medium force that are just much more like tactically savvy like fed uh, the fed sons are you potentially have something over time that can be incredibly powerful there but that didn't work out obviously but i think like the enforcer for me is um it really is the the post child and the the enforcer you can see there is actually uh, in my um my fed sons forces in terms of uh well, we'll do weapon loadout first weapon loadout it's got an ac10 on that right arm it's got a large laser and then it's got a small uh, laser just in case that's really really great weapon loadout especially if you're playing like 30 25 era that that is a mech that can do a lot of damage i mean the great thing about the enforcer though is its maneuverability it's a 464 it's a pretty standard engine at a 46 but that jumping of four just gives you a real advantage uh in terms of um well we'll do heat management first so 12 heat sinks um that's actually pretty good i mean it comes in at an alpha strike of um what's that eight 12 points of heat on an alpha strike obviously if you're jumping that's going to make you a lot hotter so you've got to be slightly careful with that with that you probably have to you know you'll be able to do it once but if you, you can't just keep jumping and alpha striking you'll do all manner of problems uh, in your heat management um it does have a standard armor and standard internal structure though that's to be expected because it's um this is very much like a quintessential 3025 mech um i probably should have said this when i wrote the copy at the beginning but all the mechs that i'm dealing with here are like the the standard variants there are obviously like there are later versions of the enforcer you can get for instance like the enforcer 3 which i think is a great mech um it's got a weird title like you, when they call it an enforcer 3 you think it's going to maybe be like a heavy mech like they've upped it to like a 60 tonner or something like that but not at all it's just like it's basically just the regular enforcer maxed up to 11 with all like the new technologies um so yeah it's it's, it's a glorious mech really um you, you, i could i could get like a lance of enforcers and have a lot of fun giving a lot of annoyance and pain to the opposition because they just like buzz around like flies and all they need is that ac10 and that l laser as well is obviously great um it's weapons that work in synergy with each other because they've got the exact same like ranges 
So, you know, you can just have like uh, a good time, like really annoying your opposition by jumping around, outflanking them. They can even, you know, they, I mean, it's a 50 ton max. It can't take a massive punch, but it's got 15 points of armor on like the left and right torsos. Um, nothing, it's a relatively solid, solidly armored mech. So you can, at a, like a real push, like use it as like a, a bit of a semi tank. If you were doing like a lance of these things, you'd probably like use two to kind of draw some fire and to, you know, get close proximity to the enemy maybe so that it keeps them busy while the other two then do the actual enforcer job and like flank and, and start like smashing from the sides of the enemy. Although ideally, I think if you're going to do that, you'd want a, a much heavier mech in the center there to kind of to shore things up as opposed to an enforcer. But but just regularly, uh, I'll just, just sorry, generally a, a very, very nice uh, mech. Next up, number four on this list, and we have got the Lao Hu. Uh, I've not painted my Lao Hu yet, as you can see. He's, he's primed and ready to go, and he's been he's on his base, uh, but he is yet to be uh, painted. He is in my Capellan Force, obviously, because he is a Capellan mech. Um, it's a late mech as well. It's the latest mech that I've got on this list by a mile. Uh, it came around in uh, 3062. Um, it's one of those mechs that, like, is sprung out of, like, Capellan, like, just basically genius for designing new mechs. They create all manner of, uh, of interesting mechs, along with the Draconis Combine do, um, do similar as well. But they use a lot of, like, their, their salvage to create their own, like, chassis on mechs. Going so far as even, like, the Capellans create things like the Menchen, which is a, an Inner Sphere Omni mech. Uh, M the Men the Menchen. I was want to say that incorrectly. Uh, the Menchen though is not the best mech because it's got, if I remember rightly, um, it's not on this list. Obviously, it's got um, four uh, M pulses and an LRM fifteen. They are not weapons that work well with each other. The the Inner Sphere uh, M pulse is actually pretty bad. Um, it's got really really bad range. The max range at six, which is awful. Um, the clan impulse is far superior as you'd expect. It's clan, um, but you see the the problem is obviously that because the succession was like destroyed technology uh, for the inner sphere, when they are kind of recapturing the technology of old, they are yes they're getting uh, uh, like Star League era technology back, but unfortunately for them, the clan's actually like one up to clan t uh, sorry um, Star League technology so they actually increased the range on their impulses because they didn't have succession wars and like destroy their entire technological base so that's something you have to live with like when um when the inner sphere are creating their own mix you do see a lot of like substandard weaponry in compared to the in comparison to the clans but such is life on to the sub topic at hand though which is the lao hu which i think means tiger i don't know why it's in my head though. i didn't check that i think that's what it means the Lao Hu, I mean, let's just talk about how cool it looks, first of all. It's got a giant sho uh, like shoulder gun there on the right-hand side. That's actually an LB-20X. Um, it's a completely weird design. I mean, no no way on earth would that mech ever like pass the like the drawing board because the pilot can literally not see like <laughs> about, what, 33% of his like view because there's a giant gun in the way of his head. So it's very, very strange, and you don't often see that in Battletech, but you can forgive it because it just looks so damn cool. And, you know, torso twists are a thing, so if they really want to look um, to their right-hand side, they can just, like, you know, turn the torso right. Um, so that's its first weapon there. Second weapon is an ERL laser, uh, which I love the design of that. It's like it's on the left arm there in that big box, and like that's so unique. You don't really see that very often at all with, like, um, with... L lasers again it's it's Capellan and Capellan usually has like weird and wonderful designs for their mechs um, probably like because they're by far the most like efficient mech designers in the inner sphere because they are the smallest power so they're probably they've probably got less to work with or they have to be a little bit more ingenious a lot of that comes I suppose from the uh, you know the end of the succession wars when they were getting absolutely hammered uh, especially by like the Fed Sons, they were like well, the mechs that they were creating. Things like the Cataract, which is a, a heavy mech that's like very nefarious for having like being a Franken mech and having mechs uh, parts from all different manner of mechs. I think it's got like the 
is it that like the right arm of a marauder and the left arm of a shadow hawk or something like that? I can't remember the, the way it's all um, split up. But basically, yeah, it's um, it is a Franken mech, and that but that leads to like ingenuity. It leads to like the Catharax a great mech, you know, as, as a standalone. The, the very fact that they're using other components from the mechs is irrelevant. It's still very very good. And, you know, the Lao Hu, I think, aesthetically, that really kind of pleases me. Just, it looks so unique. It's also got the LRM-15 uh, on there as well. Again, not a weapon that works in synergy with the other two weapons. But when you've got big guns on there like that with the ARL laser and the LB-20, the idea in that is that as you are closing an enemy down, you'll be firing off the, the LRMs. And when you get into, like, real, you know, like, close proximity, you will shoot your two big guns. It's got a really nice uh, five eight on uh, walking and running as well, which is really nice for a seventy five ton Mac. So it can get into like you know up close and personal quite early on uh, in, of a battle if you keep sprinting. One weird like thing about the Lao Hu, and I think my love of the Lao Hu was born uh, in Mech Commander Two. In Mech Commander Two, one of the like for want of a better term end end bosses. Uh, pilots allow who and it's like a very like jumpy mech i mean i remember always playing that as a kid and it always beating me because he just like jumps everywhere and he's really like difficult to kind of get a handle on and he's using the lao who as well which is a generally a tough mech but to my knowledge there is no variant of a jump capable lao who so i don't know who in the game decided oh we'll we'll give it jump jacks no idea um i wish they would i think there would there is a you know, reason to say that a, a 75 ton mech with a big gun would actually be very useful with, with jump jacks, but they don't put it on this uh, variant. Again, I, I just, I, I had a look in prep for this video. I couldn't find a, a Lao Hu that had jump uh, jets on there. In terms of heat management, it comes in with uh, 10 double heat sinks. That gives you a 20 dissipate. That's actually fine. I mean, it comes in... Um, What's that? That will be 23 uh, on the maximum heat level. No jump jacks, so that obviously helps heat. So it's, that's pretty pretty heat neutral. I mean, obviously a little bit in excess, but I always find that if you get mechs that are between minus 2 and plus 2 on that ratio, like the Alpha Strike as opposed to how much uh, heat dissipation you have, between minus 2 and 2, that means that the mech is well designed. If you are like complete, like uh, the clans have this like turn, is it like called running cool or something? If, if you've got like a mech where oh it, you know it can um it can never build up one iota of heat uh, you know because it will oh it's like minus seven or something like that on an alpha strike that to me is a badly designed mech like put single strip the doubles out put the doubles in something else give that single heat sinks and then put some like you know better armor on there or another gun or something um but yeah like i think when you when you're dealing with like where the lao who sits here that's actually it means that you have to manage it but it means that a competent like mech warrior can deal with that just fine and you know the weapon loadout as well works to that because it's not really going to be the case that you're going to be using your lrm 15 when you're up close and personal because you take such um like penalties to hit with a minimum range especially on lrms because it's uh it's minimum of six so as soon as you get into close proximity to an enemy you'll want to drop that out which means you'll be saving five heat anyway so just a really really wonderfully designed mech actually the lao Hu. i was one of, it's one of the few mechs i was actually glad they didn't recast it in the latest catalyst um you know like uh, kickstarters because i think the old model is just gorgeous i mean I, I i i don't think that can be improved upon like it's just it's got such gorgeous detail on there uh the gun looks fantastic uh the cockpit as well you can see like the ridges on the on the cockpit there look great um it just that means that when you kind of you know paint and then put the wash onto uh onto what is the glass it will it will find the recesses there and it will just look like you don't have to do the whole dual tint thing you can if you want i can never be bothered doing that i i can i do know how to do it but i just can never be bothered uh i find that if you paint it like a a solid color put a wash on and then tint it it looks fine um but the more detail you obviously get on the cockpit the more you can do and the fact it's got those like that casing there just gives you something to to use uh when it comes to the wash it's one criticism I have of a lot of the, the old models is that they have kind of like a flat cockpit and then you just kind of like, oh, 
you know, no matter what I'm doing to this, if I don't jewel it, then it's going to look like two dimensional and a bit flat. But you absolutely don't get on this Mac. I think there was like a real wave of the metal sculpts where they really went like above and beyond. And I think it, I'm guessing it was like in the early 2000s because that's kind of when the Lao Hu was a thing. I've seen it with a lot of the other mechs that I've got as well. Like I got a, an old version of the, the Thor of Summoner. Uh, that's a fantastic mech. I mean, I actually would go so far as to say it's better than the New Catalyst ones. Uh, New Catalyst ones, fantastic, obviously, but I mean, it just it just looks like such a chunky boy. And there's some whoever's designing these metal mechs had that like they they knew how to kind of scale things correctly. Because unfortunately, some of the metal models you get are just absolutely pitiful when it comes to scale. I've had this a few times where I bought like a sixty ton mech. It looks like it could be a thirty five ton mech as scale goes. And I literally just saw it up and like use it for scenery because I'm not putting that on tabletop. Lao Hu though, looks like a big 75 ton Mac. He absolutely does. Um, so that's him. Um, first of three Capellan mechs now, really. Next up, we have got the Highlander 90 ton Mac. I adore the Highlander. Um, if, if you're going to kind of do this as a ratio, it, it missed out on top spot by like, a point or two because I just can't tell you how much fun I have with on tabletop with this guy he's absolutely a joy to play fits my like tactics absolutely like perfectly because I generally like to play jump capable mechs that can shoot from afar I'll put actually that's a little bit too simplistic I actually do like playing big tanks and you've got to in battle tech you need to know how to tank but if i've got like a command unit this the mech that i've painted here is actually in my like command um what eventually becomes a demi lance for the dust counters um and in a sense like the highlander is the chief of that demi lance because he's the one that's like sat back trying to find like an elevated position and firing off that gauss rifle just a, a, a really gorgeous mech as well in terms of how it looks. I've heard some like people be a little bit critical of the new sculpt, but I really, really like it. I think it's like, it's a big chunky boy. And the, the most important thing about the Highlander is that you get the head right. You can also as well, like you can, I mean, the Highlander quite famously has like antenna. You can absolutely put antenna on there. I mean, it's not difficult. Just find like two little bits of plastic, get one of those like mini drills, drill them in, be absolutely fine. It's something I've thought about doing with him. And I might do it at some point, you know, when I've kind of painted my forces up, because I've still got, well, I won't go into it, but what was going to be 200 mechs is now escalated into nearly 400. So yeah, I've still got a lot of painting to do. But when I've done everything and I'm kind of looking at the collection, I might be like, hmm, I think I'll put some antenna on my um, on my Highlander. Maybe on my, like, uh, my Annihilator as well. I think that, that uh, uses, like, an antenna. Like, the Cyclops as well. The Cyclops has, like, a weird thing at the back of it, which is, I think is supposed to kind of uh, show the targeting computers that it's kind of got access to. But whatever. You know, there are certain mechs that have got that kind of, um, like, aesthetic quality. Highlander's one of them. I understand completely why they didn't do it in the like the casting of these of these models because it would make them brittle and they'd snap off very easily. So it's best that they allow people to do that themselves if they want to. I'd certainly take that road anyway. I'd put it so I'd rather do my own and do my own and make it secure as opposed to have it and then risk it snapping off and you can never glue it back on properly. So yeah, gorgeous looking Mac. Um, completely fits my play style. It's a mech, I mean, I always associate the Highlander with the Capellans because it's, very, again, from Mech Commander 2, which where it is very much like my formative years playing Battletech. Um, no, actually, that's wrong. It's more Mech Commander, the original, um, what, the, my formative years. But Mech Commander 2 is the one that I liked the most. But I was a little bit too old at that point. Like, that's when I started to kind of come out of Mech Commander a little bit. Sorry, of, mech, of uh, Battletech. But I think because it was kind of one of the last things that I did, it's kind of fresh in my mind, if that makes sense. So I always associated the Highlander with a Capellan mech because it's... Um, no, sorry, I'm getting this completely wrong. Um, duh. The, it's the absolute opposite. The Highlander in Mech Commander 2 is a Lyran mech. Sorry. Uh, subsequently, I have gone back. I'm, you know, I'm thinking of the Cyclops here because the Cyclops is a mech that is kind of associated with the Capellans. 
in uh, in Mech Commander Two. Um, in um, in Mech Commander Two, though, the the Highland is very much uh, a Lyran mech. And then when I've kind of gone back and looked into that, it's actually a mech that in the early, in the like latter days of the Succession Wars. Um, the Capellans like had access to them and were kind of rowing a couple out on the factory floor. I think eventually it kind of gets taken back over by the Lyrans, and that's because the Mech Commander Two is actually set at the um, in the Fedcom Civil War, obviously. So that's a lot later. So by that time, it is a mech that's associated with the Lyrans. So it's quite got quite a complex history. But in my mind, like if you go back and like look at the master unit list, the Highlander is all over the Capellan lists, and not really uh, on the others. So it is a Capellan mech, and that's good because the Capellans know how to like get the most out of them. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of one thing I really like about Battletech is that the Capellans are like universally despised by most like Battletech players. So what do the game designers do? They decide to kind of give all the cool mechs to the Capellans. I really like that. It's like good level trolling because it makes you have to think about your forces. Um, and even like question the whole narratives that people put out on this about certain powers and you know like they try to kind of you know sell their propaganda to everyone else like oh you know yeah of course the Kareeta are evil because here are all the war crimes they've done it's like yeah but I can point to as many war crimes that like the Fed Sons or the Lyran Commonwealth or the Free Worlds League has done um, so you've got to be slightly careful with stuff like that you know don't don't get roped into other people's narratives Anyway, let's discuss the Highlander very quickly. Um, so it's a, a relatively slow mech, but it's got jump jets. Um, so it's a 353. Three. That three as well, that three on jumping makes such a difference because, you know, a 3.5 is obviously quite slow. It is a 90 ton mech, so it's a, a big old boy. So you are going to be jumping a lot. Um, it's the, I think, the only mech that I am aware of that has like a signature move, like a wrestler. Um, how can you not love that? I mean, that, that almost alone makes me want to put this at number one because having a signature move is awesome. It's called a Highlander Burial. It's basically just death from above. And it it basically is able to do that because it's got incredibly high levels of armor on the legs. Um, almost, it's got 38 points of armor on each leg and 40 on the center torso. So it's, its legs are insanely well armored. That's because you obviously take damage to your own legs when you do death from above. So it's to mitigate that, ergo it is its special move. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, that's amazing. And it, it's a real threat as well. Is that like death from above, if you pull it off, he's going to absolutely devastate your opponent or their opponent, your opponent's mech. So is are they necessarily going to want to close down on you? Because even though you've got, we'll go for its weapon loadout now. So it's a Gauss rifle, LRM-20, 2M lasers and SRM-6. So obviously you've got minimum range penalties on the LRM and the Gauss. Um, the Gauss not so bad, it's only two, so it doesn't really come into play unless someone like really gets up close to your face. Um, but the LRM is obviously pretty bad. So you probably think most players will be thinking, I'm going to try and close that mech down so that it can't like, optimise its weaponry and I'm going to harass it, try and get rear shots. Very difficult to do with the Highlander though because it is jump capable, especially if you're on good terrain. You know, if you've like jumped high up into trees, and you've got like a small light mech that's trying to kind of harass you. Well, you can almost try to outflank that, you know, with your jump jets. And by doing that, when you've got that close range weaponry of two M lasers and um, an SRM6, he's going to devastate a light mech. So you've got a lot of like really good defensive options there. But what it's really used for is like a skirmisher, um, like the ultimate skirmishing mech. I mean, if you camp this thing up on high and just fire down with the like the LRM-20 and the Gauss rifle, you are just going to absolutely obliterate your opponent. Uh, I think end of the succession was, they won't have been a better mech in service. It's an absolutely incredible mech. There is a variant as well. This is the, the, like the vanilla regular version is the, uh, the 732. There's also a variant called the 732B, which is an incredible like Star League era Highlander. Uh, this Highlander, though, the, the regular 732, uh, just has 12 regular heat sinks. That's not actually too bad at all, though, given that its maximum heat that it generates is 17. So, you know, you're coming in at f uh, 5, like excess heat, and then, obviously, you can only jump 3 spots, so you're not going to generate that much by doing 3 spots jumping. So, if you are, like, struggling with the, the heat side of it, obviously, you just, uh, you know, you'd probably not fire your SRM6. <clears throat> That's 
uh, far heat right there. Everything else, though, is, is like, I mean, the Gauss rifle and the LRM20 collectively do seven points of heat and potentially um, 35 points of damage. So that's, that's like, as far as, like, economy goes in terms of your weaponry, that's amazing. So I, I can't see anything bad about the, the Highlander. It's just such a... It ticks every box for me in terms of, like, its aesthetic look, weapon loadout, style that I like to play. Excuse me. It's uh, it's a support mech. It's got enough armor that it can, it can't tank for you because, I mean, uh, well, if it it's got the same similar kind of weapon load out to something like a Jenna, like a thirty five ton mech. When it comes to like you know close range, with I think the what's the Jenna is. Um, I used to play a different variant of the Jenna. I like the one that's got the the more armor and drops the SRM four. Um, but this is not a million miles away from that. With with two M lasers and SRM six. But my point is that if you do need to kind of shore up a center or to take, you know, basically try and like manipulate the enemy into firing at a specific target, you can do that with the Highlander because it's got really, really decent levels of armor. And it's relatively maneuverable well as well with that 353, so it can get into positions and help, you know, your your like lance mates out and just yeah, just a beautiful mech. I, mean, I can't say anything bad about it at all. There, there are literally no negatives. It's um it's beautiful. And and one of the it's not it's not an iconic mech of Battletech in terms of like outside of Battletech. It's not what people think of when they think of Battletech. When they think of Battletech, they think of, um, you know, like people who are involved in gaming who are not big tabletop Battletech players or whatever will kind of see straight away, they'll know things like the, the Mad Cat, right? You see the Mad Cat, oh, it's a, yeah, I know what that's, Battletech, right? Highlander's not in that bracket, but for like people within the... Um, the Battletech sphere, whatever you want to call it, the Highlander is absolutely one of those like quintessential mechs. So let's move on to our number one place. And again, if you've watched my videos before, you'll absolutely know what this mech is. It is, of course, the Catapult. Uh, this is Mina. This is my um, mercenary um, force, the Dusk Counters Catapult Mina. Um, she's got little tusks. It's kind of a little unique thing that I've um, that I always wrote for her. So I did manage to get some um, some tusks from like an old um, like kit bashing thing that I was doing and uh, glued them on there. So that gives her a little bit of a unique look. Um, the catapult is first. Let's just let's deal with this in like order of, of my criteria. So. I am in love with the catapult. <laughs> I, don't, I can't put it any more stronger than that. I, I, I look at this thing and it just gives me so much joy. It's just it, that cockpit, the missile like pods, the chicken legs. It's just, it's just beautiful. It's so iconic. I mean, much like the Mad Cat is as well on the clan side. The catapult is that as well. If you see a catapult and you know anything about gaming, you'll know that it's uh, like Battletech people are talking about. It's just, it's so, it's, it's difficult to describe. It's sleek, but chunky. And that, I love that like juxtaposition. It almost looks a little bit like um, animalistic as well. Like the big missile packs to me look like big bunny ears. Like it just looks cute and fun. And it, that giant, massive head as well. I mean, it must be, it must be nice for the uh, the mech warrior actually, because it looks like there's quite a bit of space in there. So that's always a, a nice little feature. But it's just it's sleek in that there's nothing wasted on that at all. It's like it's a relatively quick mech. You know, it comes in at um, at four six four. I mean, four six I suppose for a heavy mech is pretty standard. But having the four jump jets is really really beneficial. But you can kind of see that you can see like it, you know, how it's going to be striding across the, um, like the battlefield there with those big chicken legs. Um, yeah, I just it's very very pleasing aesthetically. I think it's um, it's got like a real like charm to it, and I I absolutely love the new sculpt. I think it's an absolute like work of art. It's what what I I kind of. I've got mixed feelings on like the dynamic poses because sometimes when you're doing like a dynamic pose for a model, you know, like when you're kind of having it in like an action run or something like that, if you get it off just a little bit, it just looks like you've taken it a little bit too far. This though, to me, says 
catapult because it's got it's almost just like steadying itself ready for like an LRM launch like it's it's just look at it it just looks like it's kind of observing the battlefield it's got one leg back just in like anticipation that it might have to take some jolt from firing its LRM 15s it just looks very observant it looks like you can see that you can almost feel the mech warrior like in the cockpit like just looking seeing what's his best target here or her best target and uh, I think they absolutely nailed it. And I, I was, it's kind of weird because when you get the uh, the mechs in the a game of armored combat, so there are eight of them, and they were obviously like the first mechs that they ever really did. And I was slightly concerned when I saw the reviews of a game of armored combat because I think when we got hold of like those eight mechs, people were a little bit like meh. Like, how do I put this, right? Because they were early on in, like, their design process, I think they did make mistakes with some of those mech. A good example is the Commando. I think the new Commando sculpt is really bad, um, especially in, like, relation to the metal one that you can still get. I think the metal one's far superior. But you've got to give, like, Catalyst some, like, leeway, right? Like, this was the, the, the these were the first mechs that they designed, Another good example of a mech I don't think uh, comes up to scratch is the Griffin. The Griffin looks far too square for me, as far as a uh, like what the Griffin should be. It should be far sleeker and more like dignified. Instead, it just looks like a bit of a chunky short thing. It's a bit weird. So when kind of I found out the catapult was in a game of Armored Combat, I got quite concerned. I was like, oh no, that means they'll never sculpt it again, and they might not do a variant that I liked. Well. I don't know what happened, but they just absolutely nailed it. I don't think this sculpt could have got any gone any better. Far, far superior to its like metal, um, you know, counter. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, I, I have to kind of appreciate there's a nostalgic element to me in this because I've adored the catapult since day one with Battletech. It's the it's the mech that I always look for first. It's the mech if I'm playing any of the video games or anything else i just want a catapult i've always wanted a catapult on my books um so there is absolutely a nostalgia factor in there but in terms of like ticking that first box of does do i think it looks cool well, i don't think anything in battletech looks as anything like as cool as the catapults of course it's my number one mac in terms of like proficiency on tabletop well the first point to say here is that it absolutely does suit my style much like the highlander beforehand it's the ultimate in like skirmishing um or fire support, whatever you want to call it. Comes in with uh, two LRM-15s that you can very clearly see there, and four M lasers. I love that loadout. I mean, they don't necessarily work in synergy with each other because, you know, you, it's not going to be the case, really, that you are going to be alpha striking with that, given the minimal uh, range penalties on the LRM-15. But it's not meant to do that because the LRM-15s, or the dual MR, MRM-15s, do enough, like, healthy damage ratios from afar for you to play the catapult in that style where you would, you know, like the Highlander before, if you can get it up on a hill, if you can get it into terrain where it's taking like minimum uh, like damage in the early part of the game, you can fire off those LRM-15s and with some decent like dice rolls, you can hit an enemy up quite badly. Gives your lance as well uh, like much better tactical options because while you've got the catapult like set from like a turret position firing off LRM-15s, the other mechs can do like the majority of the work. So it's very much like, a, um, you know, a lazy mech to a lot of extents. I mean, it, it must be with that like kind of weapon load out. But one thing that sets it apart from, like some, let's like say something like the longbow, which is like the laziest of all mechs because it just, it just needs to sit behind a building and like get spotters to go and see, find it a target so it can fire off all its many dozens of LRM, uh, LRMs at the opponent. The Catapult does have those four emulators on there and they are very, very useful in their own right because what you'll find is if you go lance on lance against someone, it's, if you're playing against someone who's competent and you're playing like a battle value game, uh, it, the, the game's going to edge and flow, or ebb and flow, right? So like you might be on top at one point and your opponent's going to be on top and you have to accept that, right? Like, there will come a time where the crunch will occur and then one of you will get the bad dice roll or you'll make a bad decision or something. 
Why the catapult's so brilliant, though, is because when that happens, when the crunch goes down and that moment in the game occurs where you are like, ooh, I could lose this now, your catapult can actually run in and support. So if you've had that, like, sat on a hill somewhere waiting and there's, like, that objective that you need to get, well, it's jump capable, so you can potentially get there. Or there's that opponent that's like closing in on your mech, but it's up to, it's turned its rear to you and you're far away. So you can now, instead of like, you can spend two turns targeting that enemy, jumping LRM spamming, jump again, and then go for the ML, the M laser uh, like four attack. It just, it's such a, uh, like a tactically savvy mech. And I think for, for players that understand how like the Battletech mechanics work beyond the actual gaming system, I'm talking about like the nuances in terms of like how do you win a game or like turn the battle in your favour by doing something like tactically astute. The catapult is just one of those like optimum mechs for that. Now, I am talking about 3025 era here. Obviously, as soon as you kind of get into the clan invasion and beyond, other mechs do what the catapult can do but better because they'll have like better equipment or better heat management or whatever else but as like you know a, a relatively um early game option the catapult is is quite simply incredible i've had massive success with it on tabletop which i'm very very happy about because it's, it's my favorite mech so if if the catapult wasn't crunchy for me it would be very very difficult to put it in the number one spot here but it is I just think that you have to kind of understand how it works. Again, like um, like the uh, Lao Hu, it's very much a Capellan mech. More by accident, though. I think they would. It just kind of fell into their hands, <laughs> like during, uh, you know, like the uh, the Succession Wars. The they got the uh, you know the factory or whatever, and they they were able to kind of churn them out slowly. Granted, the the catapult is not a common mech. In Battletech, it's not something that you you see many forces using. If you read the law, there's all kinds of like descriptions in there about you know people have gone to war over like catapult parts <laughs> because you know they are like game changing mechs, especially in a time where technology was getting lost. If you have like a dedicated fire um, support platform like this, if a, a an inner sphere power had um, you know a few hundred catapults, they could pretty much change the like political situation of the of the entire inner sphere because they are that capable and you know i always kind of i look at it like this with with a catapult like it does what the blackjack desperately wanted to do for the fed sun so like the blackjack was very similar to the to the catapult when you think about weapon load that's weapon load out the blackjack is uh two ac2s though which are pretty terrible and four m lasers and it's jump capable so it's kind of, it's just like a worse variant of the catapult. But where the blackjack is strong is if you put like a hundred blackjacks on the battlefield, firing off 200 AC2s, you watch the damage. <laughs> like just, you know. Um, but unfortunately for the catapult, it cannot be spammed like the, the blackjack can. It's not one of these products that is like easy to kind of get off the manufacturing platforms. The catapult is a rarity. So if you have them, you know, use them like wisely in, in that succession area time period. Um, again, because it's a, an early mech in, in this list, it only has standard armor and uh, standard internal structure. There are variants of it though that they do improve the capital. There is a version that I quite like um, into the Fedcom Civil War. I think it swaps out its. Um, its I'm trying to think of the thing. It, it's basically got like LB2s on there, which I quite like because they're quite good for kind of crit hunting. Um, so it, they do keep up with it, but I think the, the quintessential C1 version of the catapult, which is the um, this version here, you can't really get better than that. And I think at any time period, you can run it effectively. So it's just a, just a glorious mech. Wonderful mech. Beautiful mech. Um, and certainly my favourite. I mean... If we're going to, a bit anticlimactic this, but if someone said to me, like, what is your favourite mech? It would be the Catapult, regardless of what I'm going to say about the clans next time. Um, the clans, to me, are, for all their, like, ingenious, when it, it came to, like, the technological side of things, they do not have uh, a good eye for a, a mech when it comes to the aesthetic. 
Uh, a lot of their mechs are very, very ugly. In fact, the only reason that a lot of the mechs that are on my list are on there for a set of reasons is because they look quirky and silly, which I kind of like as well. I mean, you see the catapult looks a bit quirky and silly, but it's still beautiful. I don't think any clan mech you could describe as beautiful. They're very functional. So, now that I've spoken about the clans, I um, suppose that's what I'm gravitating towards. Now, I think everything's been said that I can say about my top five list. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that. Go away and have a think about your list um, if you've not already done so. If you are new to Battletech, like I said before I got into this list, I would highly advise that you you know, read enough law and have enough understanding of, of the game system and more, more importantly, an understanding of how you want to play the game system. And if you kind of, rather than, you know, being the footnote in someone else's narrative, yeah, Battletech is a very, very rich, diverse universe. So don't just believe that, oh, the Capellans are all evil or, you know, the Draconis Combine are this or, or whatever. Like, if you like to play it in a certain way, if you like nuanced play, if you're coming from, like, the 40k experience and you play with, like, the Tau, for instance, then you're not, the Lyrans are not going to work for you, right? Like, you're going to far prefer playing the Draconis Combine. Um, as well, especially if you are coming from Tau, which has got like a very oriental aesthetic to it, that's exactly what the Combine has as well. So, you know, have a, have a think about that. Um, decide where you kind of want to kind of pin your flag before you start getting into like major force collecting, because I think if you do that, you'll find you have like a much better experience with it and can focus much better on the project at hand. Anyway, I'm going to leave it on that note. So I'll thank you very much for watching and I'll hopefully catch you again in part two.